Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network. It's brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. Easiest way to shop for tickets thanks to their revolutionary grading system. Buy and sell with two taps on your phone. Everything fully guaranteed. Football fans, $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase on NFL tickets. All you have to do is use promo code BSNFL. Download the SeatGeek app. Go right to SeatGeek.com. BSNFL is the promo code. We're also brought to you by Gillette. Did you know a Gillette razor blade edge is thinner than a single brain cell? Oh, yeah. That's the product of many brain cells at work, namely the thousands of men and women at Gillette, always working harder to make your shape better. And now you can get Gillette blades for less at GilletteOnDemand.com. Gillette, the best a man can get. Pricing applies to select products and is at the sole discretion of the retailer. Lastly, we are brought to you by DirecTV. I keep telling you this, if you live in an apartment or, an, or you're an enrolled college student, now you can get NFL Sunday Ticket without a satellite. To see if you're eligible, go online to nflsundayticket.tv and stream every NFL Sunday Ticket game this season to follow your favorite team, no matter where you live. Use promo code Bill Simmons at checkout, that's my name, to save 15%. 15%? Again, nflsundayticket.tv, promo code Bill Simmons, and as always, we're brought to you by TheRinger.com. Every Friday, I will have a new column. Football picks, some mailbag questions, a whole bunch of stuff. It'll be fun. If you want to send a mailbag question to that, do the mailbag at TheRinger.com. Also, I taped a new episode of The Rewatchables with Chris Ryan that I think will be up by the time this podcast lands in your feed. I won't tell you what movie it is, but, Kyle, do you know what movie we did? Kyle doesn't know. Secret. Are you a big fat person? It's that movie. Any hints? You know another one? Silence of the Lambs. Oh, okay. Oh, that might not be your generation. I thought it was Austin Powers. Oh. I thought it was Pat <laughs> Kyle thought it was Austin Powers. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, a classic. And this was the longest rewatchables we ever did. It's like almost an hour, 15 minutes. A lot of James Gum talk. A lot. A, a, a lot and some migs you'll get some migs too but it's a good one me and Chris Ryan the rewatchables subscribe to that podcast listen to it especially if you love that movie I would highly 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 encourage you to listen to this podcast it crosses a couple lines I'm not gonna lie some lines are crossed this is an NC-17 podcast anyway check that out coming up right now Pearl Jam and then we are talking to David Chang and Joe House about a whole bunch of stuff and then later later on my dad, who's in a Boston sports panic. But first, the Rock and Roll Hall of Famers. All right, on the phone, my buddy Joe House, renowned chef David Chang, two Washington professional football team fans, we have to talk about that in a few seconds, but first, Chang. Young Way Koo, big Monday night. It was sitting there, big comeback. All of a sudden, they're going for the game tying field goal. He makes it. He makes it. He ties the game on Monday Night Football. Timeout, come back out. Field goal gets blocked. Game over. Walk us through your emotions. Um, I turned the TV off. I was so upset. <laughs> I, I, I still haven't processed it. And what I'm now debating is, was it a poorly kicked kick or was it a great block? Oh, it was, it was a great block. They, they, they ran through the line. It seemed like it was dead on, the kick. The guy was three feet behind the line of scrimmage who blocked it. I mean, I just I can't even process what happened. I wanted him to, to have the best game. It didn't happen, but uh, let's just hope it doesn't mentally scar him because the the weight of the world of uh, all Koreans and Korean Americans are on his shoulders. So I was uh, I never liked the Denver Broncos. Now now they're mortal enemies. House, did you think he screwed up the kick or did it get blocked? It got blocked. I mean, anytime there's a block, I I think ninety percent of the time that's on the the line. I mean, you know, the the unless the kicker kicks it four feet off the ground, you always blame. The offensive line for for a block, I think. 
Yeah, that's how I feel. Well, let me ask. Let me ask this scenario: Is it better that it was blocked? Because what if he missed it like wide left? That would have been terrible. I think that it was, that would have broken the heart. It's definitely better. I agree. Yeah, this was a better outcome. Yeah. You don't know if he would have made it. He made the first one. He, he split it right down the middle. He made all the extra points. Chang, will you explain what's at stake here for the Korean American community? We just don't have that many like like uh, like sports heroes that are uh, in team sports, for that matter, right? Every you know, Koreans and Asian Americans and, and Asians in general are really good at the solo sports, like golf and stuff like that. But as a whole, the last sort of Korean football player that I can remember was Eugene Chung, drafted by the Patriots out of Virginia Tech, right? Yeah. And yeah. he was in the first round, and I was like, I was so ecstatic, but like he he sort of washed out, and uh, we just don't have anyone to like root for. That's that's of our culture. So uh, even though it's a kicker, and it's uh, you know that's like a first step, and <clears throat> so Did it's just awesome to root for. We never get to root for someone. What about Heinz Ward? That never. Um, what what happened there? Because I thought there was a there was a little bit of rooting, but it wasn't quite the same as Koo, It doesn't seem like. Well, that's the thing. I half rooted for Heinz Ward because he was half <laughs> Korean, but I loved him as a player regardless. Uh, I had Koo in my in my podcast last week. Very chill dude. It actually made sense that he's a good kicker because and he, and the way he described it was, you know, house like like your beloved sport golf. He has that kind of Jordan speech, just the even keel, everything's cool, don't get too high, don't get too low, which is also the same personality that seems to work for golf. It makes sense that golfers who succeed and field goal kickers who succeed would kind of be wired that way, right? Yeah, of course, because what you're... The wiring speaks to the, the failure component. You're, you know that you're going to miss. Golf is hard. Kicking a football is hard. You know you're going to miss. It's the resiliency after the miss that, that um, kind of describes, uh, sets the bar in terms of how successful you're going to be. So you got, you, I think the very best component is a chill bro. Who is the, I mean, Mike Vanderjat uh, for, for Indianapolis is the only um, guy that I can think of that maybe ran hot as a kicker. Yeah. And, and uh, he had a, a couple good moments, but he also ran himself out of the league. He flamed out. Vinatieri is kind of where you want to... He's the ultimate. He's still kicking. He's my age. And never gets too high, never gets too low, always smiling, always just in in good spirits. Chang, how does this how does this play out with Koo? Let's say... I mean, that was about as high of a profile game as he's probably going to be in this season. That weird, crazy Monday night game with all the weird stuff that was going on. And then on top of it, come back, all this stuff. But um, what does he have to do? Does it, is it just going to be one game winning field goal? What, what's the one thing that needs to happen to push this over the top and, and create some insanity potential? He needs to start leveling out uh, kick returners on, on, uh, on special teams. <laughs> just, just destroying people. First one down as a, as, a, as a wedge breaker. That's what I want to see. I think, I think that's what he wants to do. He said he played football in high school and and really liked hitting people and went to kicker but I think he kind of enjoys that so the first time he lays somebody out that's going to be bigger than the game winning field goal you think well yeah that too right all of there's a lot of pressure because he has to I I, I, I texted you this he has to be a hall of famer greatest of all time kicker better than Vinatieri mm. hey high goals Ku said in the in the podcast that he had not had real Korean food since he was in the sixth grade when he actually lived in South Korea. What was your reaction when you heard that? I don't know. I, I, I it's weird because he he speaks with that Southern twang now. He's from Ridgewood, and I I want to know like if he's like what he eats. Right? It doesn't seem like he even missed Korean food all that much. Yeah. So you so, you take him under your wing. It sounds like if he had yeah. If he, if he had made the team four weeks before the season and everybody knew he was the kicker, what would have happened in your fantasy league? Uh, someone would have taken him in the sixth round. <laughs> That's what I think. Six. Just to make a statement. Just to make a statement. Like, fuck you guys. I'm drafting him. Sixth round. Doesn't matter. I'm still going to win. 
Wow. I can't wait till next year. I'm I can't surprised wait it's not year. higher, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I was expecting to hear fourth round. Well, that's the thing. If somebody says sixth round, that means it probably would have been two rounds higher. All right. Let's talk about the uh, Washington professional football team. This is a rare. Do we have to? Yeah. No, we have to. Because okay. part of my job as somebody who, who you know, has been paid for many years to anticipate where things might be going in sports, it really seems like the Washington football thing is going to a bad place. All the early signs are there. The team is not good. The Cousins thing, um, they have not. They decided not to give him a good offensive line this year, almost as a strategic move to knock down his value or just because they're incompetent. And it's heading toward what looks to be 6-10, and 5-11, and 4-12, and 12, yet another wasted year for the Washington professional football team. House, do you have any optimism or hope at all? I have neither optimism nor hope. Uh, the one observation I'll make is you, you said it looks like it's headed towards. We, we've been here. This has been going on, coming on we're nearly 25 years now. The last moment of genuine excitement and hope was RG3 and his, his rookie season. Now, Cousins did uh, help the, the, the Deadskins to a 9-7 and seven division winning uh, record you know, a couple years ago. We made it to the playoffs but that that was you know measured excitement uh and we went in and played the, the Packers in the first round and got our ass handed to us 10 I, I might have got the record wrong we were 10 and 6 or 9 and, uh, uh 9 and 7 I don't remember now but yeah. in any event um this season every every single indication every single off-season development pointed in in a very down direction they yeah. are, they they hired a genuinely competent general manager and almost immediately ran that dude out of town. And in the most Washington deadskin way possible, they heaped, you know, uh, uh, rumor and and disparaging uh, assignations about his character yeah. as he as he went out the door. I mean, they they and then they used his draft plan with with the exception of one pick for the for the draft um they got rid of both of their free agent uh receivers two 1000 yard receivers in the off season both of whom um had established a wonderful rapport with Kirk Cousins and yeah, I just called him Kurt by the way I'm going to keep calling him Kurt because that's what the president of the team calls him um <laughs> the uh this is both like of a those guys are, are, are gone I'm sorry. I, I I could go through the whole list. Anyway, uh, I had very low expectations, and they are right where they they, they need they they I expected them to be. Chang, are you? I, I couldn't agree more. It's tragically sad, and I think that the smartest decision that was made by Washington Redskins this year was by the strong safety Sua Cravens, who retired at the age of 22. Because <laughs> he, he saw what was going to happen, he's like, "Why would I? Why would I want to punish myself for for nothing? This is a not even a pyrrhic victory. It's just going to be a total loss. I'd rather be the Cleveland Browns." It was a million dollars he left on the table. Well, I still think long term smart decision. You'll see. I yeah. oh, look. I agree. No, I, I look. I God bless him. He he he's like well, f the money. I don't need the money. Why would I want to go take the beating? Chang, do you find yourself rooting for the Chargers more than the Skins at this point? <sighs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is how I believe. I, I, I told this to House. If you're a true Redskin fan, right? And let's not talk about the name uh, as horrible as it is. You should not root for the Washington Redskins. It's the only way that Dan Snyder will ever sell the Redskins if it decreases in value. Right. So the best way is don't buy any Washington Redskins gear and stop watching the games. So that's what I think a real real fan will do. Well, three years ago, I wrote a piece for Grantland about where, uh, where the football fans were that rooted for this team and how the math was not in their favor because I think Snyder's like a couple years older than I am. He's probably early 50s. And you're just looking at another 30 years. It's the same math that the Knicks fans have done with James Dolan. It's the same math that the Clippers fans did with Donald Sterling for 30 years. You just look at the guy and you go, we're never going to be good until this guy sells. So what do we do? You had a radical plan to try to, what was it, basically like a GoFundMe, try to raise the money to try to buy yeah. the team from him? which Try to do a Kickstarter campaign. To, right. to, to, to buy the team and, and have an ownership system very similar to what the Green Bay Packers have, which are owned by like single shares by the fans. So 
after I wrote about that and it, and it had a little momentum for a second, did did anybody in your life ever tell you that that was actually a realistic plan? No one ever told me it was a realistic plan, but um, that that was that was a whatever happened that year. I can't remember because it all blends into one terrible year. Yeah, uh, that was that was when I realized that the only change that can uh, uh, affect the fortune of the Washington Redskins is by getting rid of Dan Snyder. It just can't happen anymore. I I, I just dislike him intensely. Well, you're close with uh, with with Stephen Ross, the Dolphins owner, right? We can say like he's you've done a lot of business with him. Can't you just convince him to switch franchises with Snyder? Just do a franchise swap? Well, well, that's another thing. Now I root for the Miami Dolphins and the whole organization. So, you know, I, that's my AFC team. I'd say the Chargers are the second team that I can root for because of Koo. But the Washington Redskins, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, it, <laughs> We could have any kind of owner, and they'd be better, you know. So, uh, I actually can't even talk about it anymore. I'm so worked up. <laughs> <laughs> mm. The uh, house. It seems like the experience of going to the games has taken a nosedive since they built the new stadium, and then over the last couple of years got worse. Our friend Nathan Hubbard had season tickets that he took over from his dad. He wrote about it for the Ringer. Like he, he could not get rid of the tickets except for like two of the eight games. What do people in D.C. say about actually going to Washington games? Uh, I can't say what other people say about it because I go so infrequently because it's such a terrible experience. It's a brutally bad experience to uh, go out there. Um, Snyder and his henchmen and the, what they've done in terms of the political um, chicanery in Prince George's County, Maryland, they control all roads in and all roads out, and they make you a hostage. They turn, it's a hostage situation. <laughs> I feel like it would be fair for somebody to go file a criminal complaint. I've been taken hostage. I've been hijacked right. by this, uh, you know. Now, if, if, of course, the problem with that criminal complaint is you do it voluntarily, but it's like you, you, there's no getting in and out of there for anything less than eight hours in my experience yeah. um, because of the way the, you know, the, where it's located, the way the roads are, uh, the way the parking lot situation is, and the actual experience of the game. I mean, this is, it, 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 it's reflective in the numbers, right? They call 77,000 people a sellout. It was a stadium that was built in the first place to hold 90,000 people, and they put great big tarps up over big sections in the upper decks because, you know, they weren't selling the tickets. It's, it's now we're way past the point where it used to be a wait list for um, dead skin season tickets. Right. And you, you can go to any game you want to with any seat geek uh, purchase that you might want to make. House. Just two taps, Bill Simmons. Um, and, and I bet I, you know, I haven't checked the market. Uh, Dan Snyberg of the Washington Post does a great job of that, or used to at least. It used to be like, you know, you could probably go to a game, um, day before 20, 25 bucks. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, oh, but I'm, I'm sure it's, it's just, l- it's just I'm sure you go for bad. zero bucks now. I, I'm well, really, but, but how it's like, no. I, I think if you're not a Redskins fan, you didn't grow up in the glory days of the 80s and like 1990 and 1991, and you didn't go to RFK Stadium, then you're never going to know just how bad current Redskins Stadium actually is because RFK was just magic. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it was incredible. We all were raised in it. it. It's very funny, this moment that's going on in L.A. with the small stadium. Who, which, which team is playing in the small stadium? The Chargers? Yeah, I was going to bring yeah. that up because I, I think – I think it's going to be a really interesting litmus test. It's only like twenty seven or twenty eight thousand people. I, w- I was at that stadium last month. It's really intimate. It's almost it's almost like a triple A baseball park. All the seats are close to the field. There's no real bad seat. It's easy to get in and out. They're, it's not dominated by the suites. And I'm going to be fast. So that's they play the Dolphins this weekend. It's probably going to be five thousand Dolphins fans in there. There's some Florida transplants here, but. I think it's going to be a cool atmosphere, and it really makes me wonder, are we going to see, is this the end of the era of, we had this, what, 10-year stretch of these people building these giant stadiums, right? Giant Stadium and uh, Gillette Stadium in New England and this Washington Stadium and go on down the line. And I really wonder if maybe the move with Washington should have been build a 45,000-seat football stadium in D.C. that's easy to get to. That has demand. It's almost like the David Chang restaurant theory. Like, you want you want there to be a line for your restaurant. 
You want it to be hard to get in. You want it to be hard to get a table. If you put it at 45000 that's what the Red Sox have with Fenway Park. Fenway Park, you, it's really hard to get in. It's hard to get good seats, and it makes people want to go. Don't you think that would work, or am I nuts? Well, that Chang's point is exactly the point in terms of how those of us who grew up in the area um, know it, lo- lovingly look back at the RFK experience. It was a 55,000 uh, uh, seat uh, capacity uh, experience and that intimacy that you describe is exactly what it was like you know they they had one particular section down by the field that was on um uh, a metal i'm, I'm gonna mess up the, the the description but it would bounce up and down yeah uh, and I the remember. fans could get it moving so it felt like the stadium was literally moving because that lower section was able to be um affected by the fans jumping up and down and we're at the point now where Snyder is, you know, trying to create competition among the three jurisdictions here, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, for the new stadium that he wants one of those jurisdictions to build for him. The least cynical thing for him to do would be to go go back to old RFK, renovate RFK, make it a 55,000 to 60,000 seat uh, joint, put the, put the team back in the city. I mean, that's his only... Uh, last and best hope at at um, you know changing the perception of of him in this in this uh, local sports environment. I mean, Chang, is that is that ship sailed? Can Snyder do anything to save himself in the DMV? No, I mean he could do everything right, and I still want him to sell the team. Yeah, I mean, there's but a- just it. He, I think mean, it's just so bad and it's so sad considering the legacy of the Washington Redskins. Yeah. Hold on, I want to talk about bacon, but first, quick break to talk about ZipRecruiter, our old friends. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Finding great talent can be tough. I get it. But with ZipRecruiter, post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different, unlike other job sites. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you, it finds them. Maybe Chang can use this to find more employees for his food empire. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. Right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. Again, ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. Back to Joe House and David. Can we talk about bacon really quickly? Absolutely. I, w- I went on House of Carbs last week with House and, oh no, it was my podcast. It was basically an honorary yeah, House of Carbs. Yeah, it was your podcast. Yeah, we talked football and then I was talking about fish and I was talking about bacon and we all of a sudden because well, you had gone to Hawaii. Yeah, me and House of Mallory Rubin had all of a sudden got into this serious bacon conversation and the do's and don'ts of bacon and what what qualifies for real bacon and I just like crispy old school, a tiny bit thicker than usual bacon is my wheelhouse. I don't like a lot of fat on it. Walk me through your dream scenario with bacon, Chang. Well, it depends on the kind. I think all bacon can be delicious, even like the cheap stuff that you get at like a like a like a, on your on a on a poor bacon egg and cheese, like the one that is almost microwavable. Um, but the, the the really good bacon that I like is thick, like country slab. That's like not super smoky, but enough to taste that smoke, and you can actually get that bite. And you see that sort of thickness at steakhouses, yep. right, where they just serve you that slab of bacon on, on a plate, which is to me one of the most beautiful things in the world. Well, but a lot yeah, of the I times, mentioned Luger's. Well, a lot of times with the steakhouses, though, Luger's is an example of they do it right. Some of the steakhouses are like. Here's this big ass slab of bacon, but it's like just almost all fat, and it's hard to find the yeah. meat. It's not cooked that well. Why? Why do they screw that up? What should they be doing differently? Because they're trying to they're trying to make money, I guess. But you shouldn't do that. I mean, bacon, here's another thing: bacon should, at, at the minimum, have around thirty percent of its body weight or, or of the of the slice in fat. Right. One of the reasons why it tastes delicious is because there is fat. Um, Otherwise, you're eating Canadian bacon, which is this, the filet. Yeah. Um, 
So bacon, to me, the best kind of baking has some kind of chew. So you bite down and you get that little bit of texture and crunch, and then you get some softness and a little bit of sweet, a little bit of salty, and that smokiness just sort of rounds it all together. So that's, that's, that's to me, like the best kind of bacon is when you get all kinds of textural contrast and, and flavor contrast. It's not just one-dimensional fat. House, where do you stand on Canadian bacon? Uh, I think it's perfectly fine on an Egg McMuffin, and otherwise you could take it and you know turn it into an uh, ultimate Frisbee competition. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd argue though, if you haven't been to Canada, so they sell, they actually call it penile bacon in in in, in Ontario. Wait, what? P- penile bacon? What? No, no, what no, is, no. What did you just say? P-E-A-M-E-A-L, penile. <laughs> oh, and, pardon uh, me. <laughs> Email bacon, and they make amazing sandwiches out of it. House, like they'll just slice, like I would say, like two inches of this stuff with hot mustard on a on a nice crusty roll. It's a uh, it's it's perfection. Yeah, that's like that sounds to me a little bit like the pork roll that you might get up in the Philly, New Jersey area. Uh, is it is it akin to that in that vein? Different. I'm just trying to oh. like. Oh, show Canadian love here because it's something that I think is highly underrated as a food item. Oh, so the, if we got it, if we had a version of it uh, here in the states that was, um, you know, a more accurate representation, I wouldn't be so dismissive. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And is there a way? To, is there a place to get this um, penile bacon here in the uh, penile Canadian bacon here in the U.S.? Penile bacon, I, I have okay, never sorry. seen it. Um, All right, but I only see it in Toronto. So if we go for a Raptors game, I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get a sandwich with you. Yeah, we 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 have to go to Toronto because we I, I'm dying to get up there and get some authentic poutine. Chang, what do you feel like we have too much bacon bits in our life? Not nearly enough, or the right amount? Because my 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 take is not nearly enough. Um, I, funny enough, yesterday I had a uh, business meeting at a random place because we just needed to meet up at a place called Bar Bacon, and everything is bacon. Everything. Whoa. I thought I was going to hate it, but quite frankly, it was delicious. I got a grilled cheese sandwich, uh, and I didn't like the bread so much. I didn't think I was going to like the bread because it had raisins and like sunflower seeds in it, mm. but. The bacon was perfect. It was delicious. And they gave me a bacon sampler. And what does now that, that mean? I think about it. What's a bacon sampler? What? Like, I want that. There was like eight kinds of bacon on a slab of like a plate. And it went from like least smoky to the most smoky. And in between was like salty and spicy. It was, uh, it was actually really good. I, I, they sent it out. I wasn't going to eat any. And then, of course, I ate the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> Where do you yeah. where do you stand on the candied bacon? Um, when done well, I like uh, one of my favorite salads that I make is uh, is a, a candied bacon vinaigrette. Oh, and 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 uh, I would make it more if it wasn't such a pain in the ass to clean up. So you fry the bacon into lardons, which is basically like half an inch pieces, uh, pretty thick. Um, and then once you render out all the fat, you leave all that fat in there, and then you throw in uh, mustard, some shallots, brown sugar, and sherry vinegar. And then mm. you take some of the bacon out that's been candied. Oh, let me back up. You candy the bacon and the brown sugar, and then you take some of that bacon out, and then you throw in the mustard and the sherry and, and, the, and the shallots, and you puree that. Um, and you don't have to add any oil because there you have enough of the bacon fat, and then you sort of sort of a hot sort of a spinach salad. Like, that's one of my favorite salads is, like, the sort of wilted spinach salad with a hot bacon vinaigrette, and I just add a little bit of the candied bacon. So it's tremendous. I can't believe House wasn't grunting during that whole thing. I, I, I was. I, I was I, I was keeping it a little in my pants. I was trying to, at least. <laughs> you know, we never talked about, House, we never talked about what the perfect blue cheese wedge bacon bits type of salad is because this is it's on every steakhouse menu and it's always a b minus at worst i always enjoy it i just i love blue cheese i like bacon you really can't go wrong with whatever the lettuce is although sometimes the lettuce is too hard my dream scenario though i think there's different types of blue cheese that people will do sometimes they'll just crumble the blue cheese sometimes they'll just do the the watery blue cheese but it doesn't have the crumbles in it but the good ones it has the wedge. It's not too. It's not too hard. It's got the blue cheese dressing, but it's also got the little 
pungent blue cheese crumbles within the, the liquidy part of the dressing. And then on top of it, it's got the bacon bits, but it's not really bacon bits. They actually cook the bacon and cut it into a little, like kind of bigger than bacon bits. And then on top of it, you put the cherry tomatoes on it. And it's just a winner. When is that not delicious? Who doesn't like that? Anyway, it, I, I love it. My, my big challenge is, uh, and, I, and I'll tell you what my default is. When I go to a steakhouse, um, I, I, there's always a competition between the wedge salad and the Caesar. And the reason for that is because, you know, a lot of some steakhouses are known for their Caesar. And I love the combination of the, um, the garlic in the Caesar dressing plus the, the saltiness of anchovies. Yeah. And I, I'm, a, I'm a maniac for anchovies. I mean, I always, sometimes I'll ask for more anchovies. Okay. So unless I know, I, I know coming in that the wedge is a special wedge. My default is always a Caesar at a steakhouse. But when, when, when Chef Chang's talking about lardons, now if I know that the wedge is going to have some de- delicious, delicious, chewy, sort of chunky bacon that goes along with that beautiful, uh, you know, towering um, iceberg lettuce, when then what you just described in terms of that blue cheese, if it's going to be like that, then I'll go wedge. But a lot of times I'm leaning towards Caesar. Chang, Can what? I just add, I think that of all, of all the descriptions you've ever said, including sports, that's the best description you've ever given about a, it, it was this blue cheese uh, wedge salad with the bacon bits. It was amazing. That was, that was poetic. Chang. Well done, Bill Simmons. Chang, why don't the chefs cut up the iceberg wedge with the bacon bits and the blue cheese and the tomatoes? Why don't they cut it up for me and make it like a, like, not a chopped salad, but... Do a little of the work so the dressing can hit all the parts. Why do I have to do all the work? That's why it's called a steakhouse. It's meant for you to do some work. Yeah. <laughs> they'll they'll do it though. Guess what? I I was out to dinner. I won't drop any names, but with a with a known food person, and this food person asked at the restaurant I was at, the steakhouse I was at. I'll just go ahead and give him a shout out because I don't I don't mind uh, giving the Capitol Grill a shout out. The Capitol Grill chopped up our wedge salad for us. Wow. But I, I like the wedge. I think iceberg lettuce is one of the most vilified, underrated lettuces anywhere. It's something that people should be more proud of serving because it's delicious. It's also good hot and sautéed. But I like the wedge because you can cut it so that it's almost like a steak. Yeah. Mm. I nice have, big meaty bites is what he's saying. My biggest issue is if there's also French onion soup on the menu. And I... And, my thing is, if the French onion soup is really done correctly, that's always going to be the winner for me. But you so often, you rarely get like the perfect French onion where they really burn the cheese on the top. We've talked about this before. And I really battle over it. I don't, I don't know which one to get. And the wedge is like a safer bet. But French onion's the higher upside. You know? If, if, if they hit it, you hit, you hit the grand slam with the, with the French onion. I, I went to Ruth Chris with my daughter two weekends ago. Which I hadn't been to in a while because she had a soccer tournament and she wanted to get a steak. And uh, I hadn't been there in a while. And I forgot how much I enjoyed not only the burning, the filet mignon and the sizzling, whatever the hell they call it. But they had the uh, the sweet potatoes with the brown sugar pecan thing on the top. It was delicious. It, w- it was like they just know how to do do it right at steakhouses these days. I think that's been there's been a lot of bad trends this decade. I think that's been one of. One of the better trends. Do you guys agree? I don't think I've been to Ruth Chris in years. I can't even remember. I hadn't been in years either. I was excited. I but, love Ruth Chris. Well, you all that all that butter. I I mean I love. I'll order it one temperature less. So I'll get it you know black and blue, and then they bring it on the sizzling platter with the butter, and, I, and then you can kind of cook it yourself. You yeah. know, in the almost Korean barbecue style, so I can get it up to the medium rare temperature that that I like. You know, I'll, I'll kind of slice it right away, um, just because I like that aspect of it. Uh, and I'm I'm not a black and blue. I'm not that. Um, I'm not a true paleo. You're a true gourmand. That's brilliant. Oh, my God. You understand, like, cuisson and temperature. That's like, I'm so proud of you. That's unbelievably complex. Wow. But, Chang, you know, I, I have a food podcast. That yeah. That is unbelievable. <laughs> That's why we gave him House so of Cards. Wow, I'm supposed wow. to know. I'm supposed that to know is, some things. That's just like, you're a savant. Like, not many people, not even cooks would understand that. Chang? But it's fun. Chang, where do you stand philosophically on the surf and turf? Um, I think it's 
I think it's fine. I don't love it. I don't love lobster uh, personally like that. I like it cooked in different ways. But, you know, um, I'd rather just focus on one thing done well. I don't need two. Right? Yeah, that's how I feel, so, too. It, fe- it feels a little gimmicky. It's like a, it's just a marketing expense. It's just to upsell you, basically. I want to ask. I want to ask Chang a question. Speaking of surf and turf, this is this doesn't fit. But Chang served two unbelievable food items at the U.S. Open Tennis Championship what? that just concluded. He did. It's it's a true fact. Chang, tell the people because here's the thing, Bill. This is this is the groundwork I'm laying right now. I demand an all expense paid trip to the U.S. Open next year so I can sample the entire food environment up there in, in Queens. All right, done. Um, but Chang, tell the people. Yeah, done. That's what he said. It's done. Unbelievable. Tell the people what you had at Fuku. So this is our second year of having a stand, and uh, last year we served the Mac and Row, which was a our uh, habanero spiced fried chicken sandwich with bacon and ranch dressing. Uh, very apropos for the conversation we've had today. And uh, this year we got even a bigger stand, and there was room for a grill, so we decided to add a burger because. I've been reluctant to ever do a burger, so we decided just to do a one-off pop-up, and we called it the 163. I joked, I joked that we call it the Vitas Carolitis Burger, and we <laughs> served a double-stacked Pat Lafreda burger with cheese, our own special sauce, and the real difference was was the bread. We served it on a Chinese Bing bread made by the wonderful bakers at um, at um, oh my god, I can't even remember. I'm blinking out. Um, it was a Chinese Bing bread. So it's a Chinese bread that um, is a little bit chewier, um, and we grill it. And I think the bread was necessary because once you have a double stack of burger patties, um, oh. you need that bread to sort of soak up all the juices. Otherwise, if you served it on a regular roll, it just would have disintegrated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was selling like hotcakes, I'm assuming? Yeah, it was it was it was a, a lot. And might I add, if you haven't been to the U.S. Open, the, the 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 cuisine is unbelievable. And we talk about food, we talk about like uh, tailgating, um, and you imagine football um, or baseball and hot dogs. But I think the most underrated sport for eating and drinking is tennis, by far and away, because people eat and drink for six to eight hours. You're yeah. eating like two to three meals there. And I mean, I, I was really shocked when we opened up last year, just how, like, how much these people eat. Like tennis, you just think that like they make, you know, have a salad or something. No, no, people are getting in there. And I, I love those tennis fans. They're unbelievably good eaters. I was blown away by that being at Wimbledon too. How, mu- how much food was part of the experience. And you you really feel like you have to get the strawberries and cream. Like you feel like a lesser person if you don't do it. But they had a whole bunch of other stuff too. The U.S. Open though, it it actually is a severely underrated sport to to attend. I don't really like going to golf, which is probably a subject for another uh, another podcast. I think I, d- I never know what the right decision is with golf. Like, do you stay at a hole hole one hole? Do you follow a golfer? But if you're staying at one hole, the food's got to be unbelievable, and usually it's it's not up to par, right, House? They don't, golf doesn't have the great food no, like tennis does. No, it's coming on. We'll, we'll save this. We'll, we'll have you on the shack house, and we'll <laughs> okay. talk about the proper strategy for, for consuming live golf and, and also consuming the very best food. The, the tournaments have taken note, though, uh, and they're bringing in a lot of local purveyors. I, we, there was a whole food truck um, situation here in the DMV at the um, most recent uh, tournament that was hosted here. So, you know, the golf game is, is – golf is stepping its game up in terms of the food department. But but uh, we have to – Simmons, next year, me and you, the U.S. Open, because you know Chang's going to have another stand. And the lines are unbelievable. Maybe Chang can help us cut the line a little bit. Well, you know what else? The lines were very long. We had two lines. The lines were – that's what I heard. This is what I'm two hearing. Two lines. I was very proud of our team. They all worked for two weeks like lunatics. And, uh, you know, the Fuku team, big shout out to them. But I will add, Bill, we did a stand at the Northern Trust, the PGA event where Dustin Johnson won. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to get Fuku as, uh, you know, at all sporting events. We opened up in Miami Dolphin Stadium, too, Hard Rock Stadium, earlier this year. So um, we're, we're going to get there for all sports fans. Hold on, I have one more question. But first, quick break to talk about Bluehost. 
a top-rated website provider powering over 2 million websites, whether you're a blogger or a small business owner. Bluehost has everything you need to build, host, and manage the personal or small business website you've always wanted. Design your website your way without being limited by templates. Simple enough for beginners, powerful enough for even the most advanced users. Fully customized templates, third-party app support, a 99.9% uptime guarantee, and maximum security, including malware monitoring and protection, and automatic secure web WordPress installs. I hate malware at all times, by the way. Not to mention Bluehost. Blue, blue not to mention Bluehost, 24-7 tech support online resources and expert services. No wonder it's been the top recommended WordPress host on WordPress.org since 2005. Bluehost makes hosting your website stress-free so you can get back to what matters most, gambling and eating food. And now our listeners say 50% when you sign up at Bluehost.com slash Bluehost.com slash Bill Simmons. Once again, Bluehost.com slash bluehost.com slash Bill Simmons. All right. Here's my one big question. House and I talked about fish on my podcast with Mallory last week because I went in, I went to Hawaii and I just ate fish for a week and it was great and I felt like 100% healthier after. Um, a reader emailed me and said, halibut cheeks are the best fish to order. He said it was like a combination of like scallops and lobster and nobody ever has it but when they do halibut cheeks is the move where where, where do you stand on halibut cheeks chang mm, they're delicious but like i don't know if it's the move i think that's uh hyperbole and okay. that comes from a person that lives in hyperbole i think it's a it's a smart call but you have to wonder like halibut depending on the size right like you can get like a massive, like, couple hundred pound halibut. But regardless, there's only going to be two cheeks per fish. So if they're offering that as a special, like, how have they been getting all these cheeks? That's what I would ask. Mm. Right? If it's a special, then you really only have one order of halibut cheeks. Right. What if they're, so, so let's say, let's say you're at an unbelievable fish place in Hawaii where you know they're catching the fish. Every single fish is on the menu. You, you basically have your choice. Any any type of fish you've ever wanted is on there. What's your order? Um, man, that is like the best question I've ever heard. Thank you. Um, wow. I, I like the, the flat fish. I love Dover sole. I know people say that, but real Dover sole is delicious. Um, Turbo is probably still my favorite. I know I mentioned it before on yeah. the House of, uh, House of uh, Carbs. That is just, to me, a fish that you can eat with your hands. Um, it's, it's, it's just, um, it's got everything. It's still got the cheeks, but they're way smaller. Um, and, 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 I mean, we should get a Turbo dinner one day, and we should just fly one in and, and grill it, and, and then you'll see what I mean. It's, it's probably one of the most exquisite grilling fish, and that's the fish that I would eat. Um, you know, without a doubt. Wow, so. House, what's your answer? Uh, I, my, I, I would never say anything different from from Chef Chang. So obviously, the answer is is uh, Turbo. I need to have the wonderful Turbo. You coward! You've never even had that. What are you talking about? You don't know what it tastes like. I, I, I'm sure I've had Turbo in my life. The I, I truly love. Um, Sushi grade tuna. I mean, I you know, I'm 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 dumb that way. I know you how wanna, pervasive it is. House. No, I don't want to cook. No, okay. no, no, I don't want it cooked. Because uh -uh. you've done so well talking about ordering the bl black and blue steak uh, on the sizzling platter. <laughs> and then if you went down to say that you wanted sushi grade tuna cooked, I mean, that, no. that just negates everything that you've done positively today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I hesitated to volunteer that that would be my my go to fish order because I know that how what a cliche tuna is and and how it's overfished and everything that goes along with it. But still, you know, there, it's it's the succulence of that when it's perfectly prepared and and the um the, at the right temperature that you know it's got a real a real chill to it. It's just unbelievable to me. Chang, I have a task for you for 2018. Because you you just continue to conquer the food world, you conquered fried chicken sandwiches, which people just didn't think could happen. I think hot dogs are the next frontier. My wife and I we we were flying home from Hawaii with our kids. We're in the airport. They have a hot dog stand. 
And my wife loves hot dogs more than anything, and she's just eyeing the hot dog stand. So I, I pretended to go to the bathroom. I got her like two, got two different hot dogs for us to try. One of which was a Hawaiian hot dog, and it had that whatever mustard. It was like this yellow mustard, not too spicy. And then they covered it in like pineapples, and like a little, almost like a not salsa, but what's that? That uh, the, the the stuff with a little kick to it. That they put Chutney. with the yeah yeah with with pineapple, and it was like a on the bigger side, um, the hot dog. It wasn't like a long thin one. It had a little little beef to it, and she was out of her mind. Was it penile? <laughs> it wasn't. Was it a <laughs> penile hot dog? <laughs> but uh, who would have ever thought to put pineapple on a hot dog? It was outrageous, and it just made me think like we're not we we haven't really put all of our smart chef brain cells toward the hot dog yet? Well, I, I, I reserve judgment on a pineapple hot dog. I'm going to have to taste this myself. But secondly, I agree with you because I myself went to the land of hot dogs because I did a dinner with a bunch of chefs in Austria uh, about a month ago. And we did this little tour uh, in the wine region of Austria and all we ate were sausages. And hot dog is, you know, the descendant of you know, all the sausages that came from Germany and Austria. Yeah. And I was blown away. And they don't even put it in a bun. They they grill these giant hot dog like sausages. And they're a little bit thicker than a than a hot dog. And uh, they grill them so they're super charred. And they just slice them on a diagonal and put toothpicks in them. And you drink beer and wine on a plate of, of just cut up, you know, sausage like hot dogs. And I was like, what, what's going on here? Where, where, where is the bun? And you don't even need it. The sausage is so delicious. And with Ugh. the great mustard, I was just blown away. And I was like, this, is, this kind of eating needs to be done more in America, where it's just sausage on a plate, hot dog on a plate, but like a really exquisitely done hot dog, if that makes any sense. It doesn't look like a normal hot dog. It looks like the best hot dog that's ever been made. So like, uh, like toothpicks? Like you're stabbing the pieces with yeah. toothpicks? Yeah, uh. you're standing. You're, there's like a table, standing table, and there's no chairs, and they just keep on dropping plate after plate of, on wooden plates of like grilled, beautifully wood grilled uh, hot dog like sausages. Like uh, I don't even know the, the Austrian German name of it, but it was it was brilliant. House, where, how does that resonate with your with your brain right now? Um, I'm starving. I didn't eat lunch today. <laughs> And uh, there is Chef Balud here, you know, Daniel Balud, famed chef of, of Daniel up in New York, has a little outpost here, a, a, a DBGB here in the D.C. area uh, that I'm not that far away from. And he offers sausages on the menu. I'm about to hang up this call and walk down there and order all the sausages. Great idea. But before you do that, one last, last thing. I don't think Chang knows the story. Do you know about David Stern and hot dogs, Chang? No, I don't. So any any New York, like, uh, I mean, any NBA, like, uh, commissioner's party or anything, like, with that the NBA was throwing, like, three in a row had pigs in a blanket. As you know, they hand out the appetizers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, pigs in a blanket. And I mentioned it to somebody who works for the NBA, and it was like, yeah, that's David's thing. It's the, it's, he loves pigs in a blanket. He always, he wants, anytime there's a party, he has to have pigs in a blanket. And apparently, this is what this person told me, apparently they, they had a party and there was no pigs in the blanket and he flipped out. <laughs> it was like ripping into people. It's like his staple, the pigs in the blanket. So then after I was told this story, like the next two or three I went to, there was pigs in a blanket. And it was like, it wasn't even like there were that many choice, you know, it was like maybe, uh, Little sliders, but pigs in a blanket, not like a the most common hors d'oeuvre at a party. You'll see it, but you won't see it regularly. And uh, and it it was my favorite David Stern tidbit. The dude loves pigs in a blanket. He can't be all that bad, right? No, I, I actually met him once, uh, and he was super cool. And I, I this sounds apocryphal, but I'm pretty sure he told me that he grew up in a, like a butcher's family. Is that true? Yeah, that, I think like that is York. true, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that is yeah, true. He knew everything about food, literally. He was telling me about all the cuts, and I was I was 
genuinely impressed with his food knowledge, and he just seemed like a super swell, smart guy. So um, I, I thoroughly enjoy this Pigs in a Blanket story. It makes me even like him even more. <laughs> house, maybe that's a House of Carbs guest for you. Oh my! Yeah, I don't. Do you think he he's over his uh, his genuine disdain for you? <laughs> um, we got along great for years. He's never forgiven me for the Chris Paul trade and what I wrote when that got vetoed. Yeah, he, it was kind of a mistake. What you wrote was was accurate. Vetoing a trade, not 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 a good look. He dead fish handshake me the last like three times I've seen him. Maybe he's now that he's retired. <laughs> maybe he's forgiven me. Who knows? Uh, Chang, anything to plug? Uh, no. I mean, <clears throat> gearing up for this L.A. restaurant, so uh, yep. we're doing that. And uh, we're renovating Nishi soon, So, and uh, we just got a bunch. And we just, uh, we just announced today that uh, we're opening up a noodle bar in the Time, <clears throat> excuse me, a noodle bar in the Time Warner Center. So oh, actually great. a lot to plug, I guess. Excellent. <laughs> and also your House of Carbs appearance. House, you want to plug that? Yeah, real quick, we're going to have uh, an outstanding show next week. Um, Chef Chang, God bless him, um, was thinking about how to help the Houston community. So we had two chefs, two of the most, two of the real pillars of the of the food community down in Houston. Come on, House of Carbs. We'll run it next week to talk about their experiences with Harvey, what they're doing to get back on their feet, ways that people can help. And, you know, the the not to bury the lead, the best way to help, get down to Houston. Houston is open for business. The food and drink, and Chang and I are already planning a trip. So that that's House of Carbs next week. You guys are planning a trip, but I'm not invited. Well, that was the, that's the only way the trip's going to happen if you're not invited. Damn it! All right. <laughs> well, send me some pictures at least. Thanks, fellas. Sorry about the Washington professional football team. Maybe next year. <laughs> I'm not sorry. F them. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys. We're going to call my dad. He doesn't know we're calling him. But first, want to talk about my bookie? From a gambling standpoint, we are going to remember the 2010s as the decade when live betting took off. And where you're betting is just as important as who you're betting on. Here's an idea. Go to mybookie.ag. They've been in this business for years. Their reputation is rock solid. They do 100% cash bonuses. So off the bat, you're making money for doing nothing. And they have the fastest payouts. Seriously, just two business days. They have in-game live betting. They have the most rewarding player perks in the business. And they have an all-new mobile site that makes wagering on the go a breeze. In-game live betting. It's kind of the last frontier for me. I haven't do- I haven't dived in yet, but I, I, it's going to happen. Lay down some cash. Try to win big today. Join now. And my bookie will match your deposit with up to a 100% bonus. All you have to do is visit mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Bill Simmons to activate the offer. M Y B O O K I E dot A G. You play, you win, you get paid. All right, here we go. We're calling my dad. All right, my dad's on the line. We're taping this on a Tuesday afternoon. I didn't tell him I was calling. A um, lot of Boston sports stuff coming on. Rank it. What are you the most worried about? Kyrie Irving being a superstar for the Celtics, the Patriots dynasty being over, or the Red Sox having no real chance in the playoffs. How would you rank those three? Um, I'd rank the Red Sox being in trouble for the playoffs. I'd rank second the uh, Patriots being in trouble. And I'm least concerned of the three you mentioned about Kyrie Irving. You were... I, I just yeah, I just think he's a he's a twenty five year old superstar whose whose best years are ahead of him. You're pro Kyrie trade. Some people in Boston were anti Kyrie trade. Well, you know, I've I, I we talked about it once before and I, I loved Isaiah Thomas and I having watched the games in person, nobody gave more to the Celtics, Boston, the fans than he did. You know, uh, we were there the night his teeth got knocked out, everything with his sister. I mean, he just was tremendous. But um, I just don't know at his age whether he's the kind of, whether he's somebody you give maximum contract to. So I don't think the Celtics were going to, and I was afraid that he was going to be a free agent in a year and we would get nothing for him. So, and then the hip issue yeah. uh, shows up. So 
it's very, you know, everything we're reading, it's possible he's not going to be back to January or February. So um, putting all that in perspective uh, and getting the opportunity to bring on somebody like Kyrie Irving, uh, I am in favor of the trade. The, the, you know, I certainly was worried about that Brooklyn pick. And then I look at the status of all these terrible teams in the league, uh, whether it's Chicago or Indiana or Atlanta or you go down the list. And we saw it last year. You get to the months of end of February, March, April, these teams are tanking. And then you have Brooklyn and the Brooklyn pick that now is owned by Cleveland. Brooklyn played great the last 20 games last season. They have no reason to tank this year. They don't own their own pick. Yeah, And I, I, I just question whether the value of that pick is going to be even a top five. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm putting all that together, I'm in favor of the trade. Yep. You didn't like it when it happened, though? I was No, I didn't like... You know, I don't know whether it was me looking at uh, objectively at, at, at the components of the trade or it was more me feeling that the Celtics and Danny Ainge had been disloyal to somebody like Isaiah Thomas who had given so much of himself to the team. So I, it was my initial reaction, and you know, now we've had weeks to objectively kind of look at it, and I feel different. Well, it was disloyal, though. I mean, they, well, they did yeah, kind of saw him down the river. It, yeah, it, it was disloyal, and... You know, it's a, it's a very, you and I talk about it, it's, a, it's this really strange time in professional sports where both sides are disloyal. I mean, the lo- or another way to put it is the loyalty isn't, isn't there anymore. Uh, I mean, we've seen players traded throughout the years, but uh, when, you have, when you have players like LeBron leaving Cleveland and then leaving Miami, and then now he's going to leave Cleveland again, and you have Paul George leaving Indiana and he's going to green your pastures. And then you have the teams trading people like Isaiah Thomas. And I, I guess, I guess the reality is, and it's so hard to look at it objectively as a sports fan is that there is no loyalty on either side. It's uh and maybe there shouldn't be, maybe, you know, we all want a championship and, you know, I, I go back to 0708. I loved Al Jefferson when he was drafted by the Celtics. Uh, didn't get to see him play that long, but uh, would have loved to have seen him here his whole career. Wasn't sure about that trade initially. Certainly would take a championship as we got one. And I guess that's what it's all about, both for the uh, players and the owners and the fans. We want championships. Yeah, so remember, sure yeah, remember when Ray Allen left and there was like some trader stuff with him? I actually defended him because they tried to trade him like three three different times, including well, yeah. one trade that was like canceled right before the deadline. I can't remember what year it was. And at that point, it's like, well, why should he be loyal to you guys? He knows that you tried to trade him. He knows yeah, that you shopped him. Yeah. So what? what is yeah. he supposed to just be, oh, I forgive you? I I never understood that part. Well, you know, it's interesting. Today he gave a, an interview. I think the first one I really heard him, where he, on an ES, your old employer, where he articulated just what you were talking about. That, on the other hand, I would I would have been okay if he had signed with any of the I other know. 28 teams except yeah. the team that we had just gone to war with. Uh, that's for me. That's all. That's the single thing that made that so difficult, that he went with Miami. And, boy, we had just gone to war with Miami, and it just it just seemed like maybe if you're going to leave, you go somewhere else, you don't go to that team. That's right. All. Well, he didn't care. He wanted to live in he South Beach to play with LeBron. I cared. He I know, didn't but care, but... Yeah. It's funny, though. It has changed as, this, as the 21st century has gone along. It seems like it's been one of the things that's changed the most about sports. And I think... Even going back to when Johnny Damon went to the Yankees, and I remember writing about it for page two when it happened, and the Red Sox fans and the Boston fans were so betrayed by Johnny Damon. Right. They just couldn't believe that he left, and they couldn't believe that he went 
to the well, Yankees. Well, on the heels of the 2004. Oh, yeah. But, you know, all of that great playoff stuff. I know, but mem- remember, people were so upset, and I, I was, I, I went was against, really upset. I was upset too. But I went against the grain. I wrote a column about it, basically, like there's no loyalty in sports. Like, they would have traded him tomorrow if he was sitting two twenty and they want to get rid of his contract. And I think if something like that happens now, it's just not as big of a deal. I think from the decision with LeBron all the way through to KD going to Golden State and leaving OKC a year ago. And now it's just fans are ready for everything. They just assume these guys are going to jump around. They assume the teams are going to trade them as soon as they're not the asset they want the asset to be. And that's just the way sports is. It's really it's a strange time. It's definitely one of the weirder times we've had that I can remember. It, it really is. I, you know, I will say, though, way back in the uh, 80s, you and I had a conversation when there were rumors that uh, Dallas, the Mavericks, we're looking to trade Perkins and shrimp for Mikhail. Shrimp yeah, for Mikhail. And and you and I debated: uh, Do you do a trade like that? You know, you've had Mc. And and I'll, I'll throw a, it's an it's an ironic wrinkle that has a similarity to Isaiah's hip problem. We had watched Mikhail play with a broken foot in yeah. the '87 playoffs, and uh, he he should have sat out you know, for his own personal future career. But he played and uh, further damaged. And now we see him walking around with a limp. Uh, yeah. Okay, so after all of that, the Celtics at that time made a decision uh, not not to trade Mikhail or a bird. And eventually Parrish left as a free agent. Um, should we have made that trade for uh, Shrimp and Perkins? Probably. Uh, probably well, remember what they the did? They they used Danny Ainge instead, and they traded well, him for yeah, Joe and, Klein and Ed Pinkney. Exactly, and, and Danny Ainge mentioned that when he gave his press conference uh, after introducing Irving to the Boston community. That and any kind of reference trading Isaiah and how hard it was. Yeah, and he talked about how hard it was when he learned he had been traded from his beloved Celtics. So, and maybe that shaped his whole viewpoint on loyalty and trading players that the fans love um, because he got traded. And uh, I think he got traded a second time, too, from another team. And Well, he went to uh, – uh, he got traded to Sacramento, which was even worse. He went yeah. from being on, you know, playing with Bird Parish and Mikhail to going to NBA Siberia, basically. But true, true. It's, it's interesting. They didn't trade Mikhail. And then no. – but if you remember the ninety ninety one season, then the following season, before Bird's back went out, but that team was really good, and it actually seemed smart that they didn't trade McHale, and they had Reggie Lewis, and they kept the big three, and it was like, oh, this is good. It was actually a good idea to do this this way. And was then, that the year we uh, almost beat Cleveland? That was ninety two. Yeah, that was. Okay. Yeah. They lost yeah. to the Pistons in ninety one, but they had like a second run with those guys. But now looking back. If they had been able to turn McHale into a young shrimp and a young Perkins, like I'm sure Ainge looks at that and says, "Oh, they we should have done that in a in a heartbeat. We should have made that trade, and maybe that shapes I, I some think, of what he does." I suspect he does, and I, I mean, it was, I read somewhere very recently that both McHale, uh, that both um, Bird and McHale had said they wanted to retire as Celtics. Yeah. Um, but then I read that both per, uh, Pierce and uh, Garnett had also said to Ainge they'd like to retire as Celtics. You know, nobody's nobody's criticizing the trade he made then for those New Jersey picks or Brooklyn picks. Yeah. Um, maybe it depends on the outcome of the trade, which we don't know yet. Uh, so it, there's a long-term view you have to take, whether it, it was okay to trade people that have been loyal to the franchise. Uh, it's a, just a strange, it's a different time. I, I, I don't know that we can equate it to other times. And Well, this is a good, this is a good audible, the Patriots though, because you could have made the case. And I, I think I might actually have made the case in a mailbag last spring that they probably should have traded Gronkowski if, if there was a market for him with all the surgeries and different 
kind of injuries he's had and the durability and the fact that he's hitting his late twenties and I suspect there wasn't the kind of market Yeah, maybe there wasn't. To get back what you would have gotten back if he hadn't suffered the most recent couple of injuries. Yeah, don't you think they would have traded him though if they if Belichick had think, gotten an awesome offer for him? I think he would have traded him. I think they would have. I, you know, it, it it's it's the hot topic up here now. Uh, unfortunately, very unfortunately, after watching Brady's performance last Thursday night, yeah, you know, all, all of a sudden that's sparking the discussions about, uh oh, uh, have we is Brady turning? the uh, corner have we yeah. seen the best of Brady and uh, should they have moved him and just moved Gar- you know we're getting all that discussion up here um, oh, that's happening that Brady's should Brady get benched is a discussion in Boston uh, it, it's not benched no not benched but should should he have been traded to open the door for Garoppolo to take over oh, the team oh god come on did they wait too long you know oh, no. it, and you and I I don't need to mention the uh, yeah yeah the, yeah yeah, who, yeah who's leading that that discussion and it makes it 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 brings ratings up and uh, the, right. you know and that you get all the crazy callers in and all, all the people uh, how did you call out you termed it years ago the the uh, home of the miserable or something like that and that but, wasn't me but that's what that was the fellowship of the miserable I think I think yeah. uh, Shaughnessy might have even invented that one okay. Yeah. Callahan called it loser town. I remember when I was living there and then there was the fellowship of the miserable, but you know, here's the thing. This was always going to end badly with Brady. If he was just going to keep playing nephew, Kyle is producing this podcast, by the way, and he's now he's near tears now. He's very upset, but um, (laughs) Pat's fan, nephew, Kyle. But um, if you look at how Peyton Manning's last year and a half went, if you look at I'm, how Kobe's, I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to happen to Brady. No, Blitt, I'm not saying either. But I, but look, let's be realistic. This, the Lakers fans said this about Kobe once upon a time. Wow, he'd never, he's never going to end. He, he wouldn't go out like that. Well, guess what? He did, and so did Peyton Manning, and you know and Michael I, Jordan with the Washington Bullets. They, it, it, all of them, any boxer, yeah. they all go out this way. To even Tim Duncan who went out about as great as he could go out, but that last year he could barely move, you know, and he yeah, was, yeah. he was done. And these but, guys, but let's, uh, again, I want to be really careful here that Brady could be the MVP this year. Ah, and he I'm had with one, you. one bad year. I agree. Uh, he had I'm one bad game. I, I am a little worried. I have to say that. But here, here's what Thursday night did. It reminded us that this is going to end badly at some point. And it might be this season. It might be next season. It might be four years from now. But at some point, he's going to have a bad year and he's going to retire. And that's how this is going to end. Unless he leaves before that bad year on his own terms. It's how many people have done that? Uh, Not too many. (laughs) I mean, Peyton Manning came back... um, Set he threw for almost what they scored almost six hundred points. He won the MVP again. Um, would have been a perfect way to go out. In the bat four neck surgeries kept coming back. I feel like he would have played again if anybody had signed him. I think it's really hard for these guys to walk away. And at the and another really interesting test case is going to be LeBron James when it gets to that point because he's right. now going into. I think it's his sixteenth year. But, but yeah, Pey- Peyton Manning might say to you. What are you talking about? I left as I won. I won the, the Super, Super Bowl. Bowl, right? But they won the Super Bowl despite him. You know, well, he's not. He's not going to. He's not going to say that. Agree with you, but, right? But he would have come yeah. back the next year, and you know, I I keep looking at this and wondering, would this be the ultimate way, having followed this Belichick reign from start to finish, and knowing that the Brady era started? I was still living in Boston at the time. Bledsoe gets hurt, Brady comes in. And would it just be the ultimate irony if this comes full circle and like going into week four, Brady gets hurt or whatever, something happens, Garoppolo comes in, the team plays better, and Belichick's like, Brady, you don't don't get to come back. That's it. Like That would be crazy if this is how this played out. I'm not saying it would, but it would just be crazy. I hope hope it's not the way it plays out. You know, I, I... I hope we win the Super Bowl this year and Brady retires with six Super Bowl rings at the top of his game. And uh, we get to then easily 
he'll be forever a hero. He went out at on on top on his own terms, and Garoppolo takes his place. The, can the I make the is, case? Can I make the case for Brady? <laughs> well, I, I'm not. I'm. Uh, it's not that I'm not making a case. I, for I'm Brady. not saying I'd, you weren't. Don't get defensive. I'd like to. I'd like to see him go out on top. Don't get defensive. <laughs> I'm. I'm saying. I think what happened last week was understandable in some ways because no Edelman who's you look at the last 15 years of Brady's career and he's almost always had the reliable slot receiver dating back to Troy Brown. And there's really only yeah. been two years where he didn't have that guy. Oh six. And then Oh six, the year they traded Dan branch. And then right now where it's like Amendola was his only reliable guy. And they had that one play when Amendola ran the Edelman route, route over the middle to save the third down and got plunked by somebody and dropped the ball. But that was one of those over and over again, go back and watch the Super Bowls. It was over and over again, Edelman just figuring out a way to get open on a big third down and making the play. Then on top of it, you don't have Gronk, which we've talked about in the pod before, but Gronk not being the force of nature, at least in that game for whatever was going on with him. But even just him dropping that touchdown, like he never dropped touchdowns like that before. He would that that was seven points every time, and uh, and then you go through Brandon Cooks, who he's barely played with. These teams don't practice together as much anymore. So not to make a million excuses for him, but from watching football all weekend, which is all I did the last two days, none of these quarterbacks look good. Alex Smith somehow looked better than any other quarterback for for four days. So. I, I am not I'm not overreacting yet, but it did make me think, wow, they it did make me see the finish line with Brady for the first time where you just go like, Wow, how would this end when this ends? How is this gonna go? What if this is just what if he just plays five more games like this? Now what do we do? It did make me start thinking about that stuff and I hated it. Right. And I know well, you you were that's all you were you were catatonic for like twenty four hours after that game. I was yeah, afraid to call it, you. Unfortunately, too, we have 10 days between games, so it's all anybody who's a football fan, and that's an awful lot of them will be in New England. That's what people are thinking about, talking about. But the, but know, the what, real problem is that the, the defense is the problem. This defense we have, they, they, that's what we should all be really worried about, is what, what happens with defense. And it does feel like the door is now just open for the NFL. You know, and I know people could have said that three years ago when they lost the Kansas City game, but heading into the season, everybody was giving the freaking trophy to the Patriots already. And now it's completely different. It, is one, it was basically 90 minutes of football, the second half, and now everybody's like, wow, the Patriots can be beaten. There's a vulnerability that I don't think any of us really saw coming with this. But yeah, it was an awfully strange game. I, like, as you said, if Gronk. If we're up fourteen nothing, he simply catches that touchdown. Yeah, you know the, the, the momentum of the game's a little different. Um, Kansas City has been—I mean, it's been a tough matchup for us. Usually there, but obviously here as well. I thought Alex Smith had the game of his life. He was great. He, he, I don't think he's ever played better. Um, and th- that team has speed that we could not counter. Uh, I'm not sure there's too many teams that have that kind of speed. Um, My fear is that you're going to be complaining a lot about Stephen Gilmore this year. <laughs> well, it, it has I, all it, the makings for somebody that you would just complain about. They overpaid him a little bit. He's not totally your type of corner. He's already made a gigantic mistake. It just feels like we're heading toward a season where you're just texting me about uh, I'm just not Gilmore. Sure. You know, we'll never know because Belichick doesn't tell you anything. I don't, I don't know if that was his mistake. Uh, they they ran three guys, three receivers on a vertical route. Yeah. Um, and uh, McCourty some, made a decision to yeah. go with somebody else. So uh, I suspect Gilmore thought McCourty was his safety help, uh, and it wasn't there. So, I mean, he... he I watched the replay. He casually kind of let let him go by him. It's not like he even tried to stay up with him. So he must have thought that uh, McCourty was on his side and he was the safety help. So, um, in conclusion, you you still fully support Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, and you still believe, you're still a believer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Oh yeah. That's the, yeah. That's the big headline. Um, that that ha- that hasn't changed. 
Uh, and then, uh, and, but I, I do agree with you. I, the defense really was worrisome in that game. Was, they were uh, bad. Ter- they were terrible. It wasn't great. Uh, you were emailing, so you were texting me, who's this guy? Not not well, not Van Noy, the other <laughs> white guy. Who, who, who is this guy? Where did he well, come there from? A, there was a guy out there chasing uh, a running back who, who I think Hunt. has like he like has four four speed. He's got tattoos all over him, <laughs> and he's twenty yards behind him. And I'm wondering who's that guy. <laughs> and uh, I keep up on these plays a little bit, but yeah, uh, yeah it was. You know, we had, we had a no name defense out there, which is fairly worrisome. So, uh, are you going to fly out to watch the Red Sox first round four game loss with uh, with your grandson and me, or are you just going to stay there? What's your plan? Fly out? What do you mean? Fly out to LA to enjoy the playoff losses with us. What's your plan? No, mo- most likely the Red Sox are going to play Houston if they win the division. Uh, Cleveland has the best record. Right. And Cleveland would play the playoff team, the uh, the um, wild card team, and we'd end up playing in, in, starting in Houston. Oh, and so you think ironic. we can beat Houston? Well, it's a, we, we, our last four games of the year are at Fenway Park against Houston. So but there's a possibility we're going to play them in nine straight games. Did it bother you, you that? Ever, did it bother you that Chris Sale could not beat the Yankees? Uh, it bothered me, uh, given that they lined it up so he'd pitch in all three series against the Yankees, sure. Um, but he had a really good game against the shitty team the other night. So. I know, I know. That was, he, he does, I, I love Chris Sale. I, I wish he had beaten the Yankees just one time. Just throw the eight inning, two hit gem. Just once. He just, didn't get a lot of it. offensive. He didn't get a I lot know. of offensive. It was frustrating. Stuff, He's been unbelievable this season, but God, I just hate. He was our secret weapon against the Yanks. Just like, all right, you're not going to be able to hit this guy. And it right. actually seems like they can hit him, and they have good at bats against him, and they drag the pitch counts out. And and meanwhile, Judge started hitting again. He he's back from the dead all of a sudden. I don't know what happened there, but uh, yeah, it should be interesting. I don't I don't really have incredibly high hopes for this team. I it just feels like the whole season is going to ride on some down two one game four. Eighth inning, bases loaded, one out, and Xander Bogarts is going to come up and figure out how to hit into a quadruple play, and then it'll be it'll be two outs that'll end that inning, but also somehow two outs for the next inning. Um, well, my my worry is it's September twelfth, and now we only have a three game lead on the Yankees. Yeah, and uh, the Yankees are hot again, uh, as you said. It's not only Judge, but. Uh, Sanchez is hitting. Yeah. The whole lineup is hitting. Severino has been unhittable as a pitcher. Um, if we ended up, if we end up in that wild card position and we have that one game playoff, I know. I mean, are you really looking forward to that? I'm not. And then Chapman, they made him. Looks like he's going to be the closer going forward again, which I actually think, if if he can handle it, it puts their bullpen in such a better spot because now Batances can just kind of rove around and come in in whatever inning, and it, it, everything know. falls I, into uh, place for them. Well, I I think if the game is at Fenway and Chapman comes in, uh, there's a different element there. I'm okay, I'm okay with him coming in in Fenway Park. Yeah, uh, having seen what the fans do to him, particularly when he comes in the game. Uh, and hey, he um, seems to lose the plate. So, hey, I talked to John Walsh for like an hour yesterday. There's, there's, we, I might have to give you guys a podcast. Oh, really? You reconnected with uh, John Walsh from ESPN? Yeah, but I was thinking the he could be your co-host for the Blue Plate Special, which people are still emailing about. They still want it. Well, John Walsh is is from my generation, and I know. Uh, believe me, I, I I know you think I'm just kidding, but. When I walk the dogs and I'm minding my own business, yeah, it's it's frequent that somebody will say, "Hey, wh- when's the blue plate special starting?" <laughs> somebody I don't know, by the way. Um, Listen, if there's a sponsor out there that base. wants to sponsor it, if they want to sponsor it, uh, get in touch with us. The blue plate special. I think depends. John Walsh is available. How about d- depends. <laughs> Anybody? You don't have depends as a sponsor yet, right? <laughs> you can break down Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think Walsh is in. It's it, we'd have to get you guys a, a producer who's 
at least over 68 to really fit in with the whole crew. But um, it would be a fascinating <laughs> podcast, though. It, it would be. There'd be a, a lot of walking down memory lane, that's for sure. Yeah, we and fortunately, uh, my brain is still intact. I mean, if you don't do it soon, who knows what's going to happen? That's true. We do, we do, there might be a shelf life. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I'm glad right. you're in good spirits about the uh, the always chaotic Boston sports scene. Talk to you soon. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Thanks to Joe House and David Chang. Good luck to Young Wei Koo. Good luck to all the Boston sports teams. Thanks to Bluehost. Whether you're a blogger or a small business owner, Bluehost has everything you need to build, host, and manage the personal or small business website you have always wanted. Simple enough for beginners, powerful enough for even the most advanced users. Design your website your way without being limited by templates. No wonder it's been the top recommended WordPress host on WordPress.org since 2005. Right now, our listeners say 50% when you sign up at Bluehost.com slash Bluehost.com slash Bill Simmons. Thanks also to Gillette. Did you know a Gillette razor blade edge is thinner than a single brain cell that's the product of many brain cells at work, namely the thousands of men and women at Gillette who are always working harder to make your shave better. Now, you can get Gillette blades for less at GilletteOnDemand.com. I really hope ever since I started doing reads for Gillette, the Patriots have not won a game in Gillette Stadium. I hope I'm not responsible for this. But Gillette, I know this much, they are the best a man can get. Pricing applies to select products and is at the sole discretion of the retailer. We have one more podcast coming up on the BS Podcast this week. Don't forget about the rewatchables, especially if you love Silence of the Lamb, Lambs. Don't forget about all of our other podcasts. Don't forget to go to ringer.com. It is Space Week this week. If you love movies, TV shows, books, anything about space, this is the week to go to the ringer.com for that. And uh, we are coming back to you later in the week on the BS Podcast. Until then. <laughs>